but um, some of you have been a bit nervous about the winds and the high winds today, and uh, we just need to let you know everything is absolutely secure. This big top, all the marquees, unlike the, the occasion here on Skegness, I think it was about 10 years ago when one of the marquees was seen crossing the beach. Did you see that? <laughs> and it went out to sea. This is a true story. It went out to sea. And it was uh, spotted by a, a, a ship. It was at one of the Spring Harvest mobile seminars. But actually, um, <laughs> there, was, there was no one in it. But I did pick up. It was, uh, it was, it was actually Steve's seminar. All I was told, there was a lot of wind, a lot of hot air. And, um, <laughs> but anyway, everything it's not going to happen again. Everything is uh, battened down. We're delighted to have you here this evening. Welcome. And um, it's my job just in the opening minutes to mention three special offers. So we want a little more audience participation as we go along. Um, you know that the tagline for Spring Harvest, which I like very much, is that it is equipping the church for action. In other words, we are having a great time here, but the whole purpose of this is to equip us for getting on with the job. And there are a number of ways in which Spring Harvest is doing that, not just through these events, but also through a range of literature, books, Bible study resources. I think the great contribution over 25 years or more has especially been in worship and in music. We're very thankful to God for all of that. And you should have received, or you will receive as you go out if you haven't had one, the Spring Harvest resource catalog, which lists all of those things I've rapidly fired out. Now, we want to uh, encourage you to look at the Spring Harvest stand, where you'll find many of these resources, including that catalog. But there are three special or, uh, offers for this evening. And uh, so let me hear what you think about it. First of all, you can buy the brand new Spring Harvest New Songs album at half price when you pre-order the 2004 live worship album. Yes, okay, <laughs> right. And secondly, most Spring Harvest books are on a three for the price of two deal on the Spring Harvest. And thirdly, receive a free 25-year double album when you, play, when you buy the excellent 500-song Worship Today songbook, which I have in my hand. So a free album when you buy this Worship songbook. So those are the three, the three free offers, and I'll put my teeth back in straight after I've said that. And you can get them at the Spring Harvest stand. Please do avail yourself of the wonderful resources. Steve. Great. I, uh, we also want to say that the prayer wall's there, as it was last night, which you can use. And in a new innovation, we've been, uh, we've been working and uh, we've sorted out some fire regulations, etc. So uh, from this evening onwards, uh, there's some people painting and drawing over there. You can actually go, not, you know, we've rather kind of awkwardly said, well, uh, on the last few nights, if you want to go tell these guys... Uh, what you'd like to draw, they draw it for you. But there's a load of paper around there on the floor uh, right, right now. And so if you want to go and paint something as the evening goes on, you can do that over there. The only thing is, um, if you take children with you, you're responsible for them. Okay, so, uh, but that, that's uh, there through the evening. Now, uh, there's somebody we would like to introduce you to, Jonathan and I, and he's just arrived on site, and he's another vicar. We've got quite a lot of vicars here on stage, and it's Keith White. Keith, come out. Hey, just pop Keith. out here. Ready? Amen. Keith, give me, Keith a big round of applause. <laughs> uh, Keith's going to be taking part this evening, and uh, he's uh, doing some seminars later on the week and speaking at one of the celebrations. Keith, just tell us about uh, who you are. You're a vicar, as I've just said. You're right. I am a vicar, and I was born in um, Merseyside. Mm -hmm very near to Everton Football Club. Thank you. <laughs> well, there you are. And, that, uh, doesn't that say a lot about Liverpool? Mm, right? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, I grew up there. I went to school, did the stuff, did some other stuff, went to college, pretended to be a vicar for a while, worked in Edinburgh, Sheffield, Norwich, Zimbabwe. So it's kind of working southwards <laughs> and, uh, and popped back up to Ipswich, where I'm now. You're in Ipswich. Are you a reverend or a... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, both of you. Yeah. <clears throat> that was his wife and daughter. Yeah. <laughs> <That's a> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you a reverend or a right reverend? I, I'm happy to say I'm a reverend. All right, not a right reverend. You're right again. <laughs> you're working yeah. on that. Anyway, Keith, we're really pleased you're here. And Keith's going to be taking part in helping lead the communion service tonight. Keith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. um, one other thing that we need to tell you about uh, right now is Christi Christianity and Renewal magazine. And uh, we're really pleased to be able to say, some of you may get this, that we've, we've managed to get a free copy for everybody. And so as you leave uh, the tent tonight, the big top tonight, you should be handed one of this month's Christianity and Renewal magazines. It's a great uh, magazine. And uh, 
if you've seen The Passion or are planning to see The Passion film, there's a fantastic article in here about ways in which uh, you can uh, use The Passion in your community and uh, it can provide openings and opportunities for conversations, etc. 20 different ways you can use the, the, uh, the Passion film or work with The Passion film and a great review of the film as well by one of the regular contributors to it, uh, Mark Green. Now, if you want to take out a subscription to uh, Christianity in Renewal magazine, having read it, at the at CNR Christianity Renewal stand here, if you take out a subscription, which costs £23 a year to do, whilst you're here, there's actually a, a free um, passion book, which is number four at the moment on Amazon uh, uh, books. And it's, it's just a pictorial... Uh, Remembrance, really, of the film. It's a great book. I've seen, I've seen a, co a copy in all of the stills from the film, or a choice of several other books. So grab one of these on the way out, look through it, and if you think it's something you're interested in, um, go to the stand there. Now, each year at Spring Harvest, what we want to do, as you know, is give uh, generously uh, to those. Who, who don't share in Spring Harvest, but we hope will benefit from Spring Harvest, as we give to projects in this country and around the world that bring the gospel, bring good news in Jesus' name into the lives of the young and old, the rich and the poor, those without hope. And this happens year after year after year, and tomorrow evening we're gonna have an opportunity to give, but right now we wanted to show you a video of some of the projects and Christian agencies that Spring Harvest has been supporting and working with over this last year. Watch this video. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Over the past five years, you, the Spring Harvest guests, have given over four million pounds to Christian projects around the world. Here's just a taster of what you've done. Through your generous giving, we've been able to give Bibles to the secret church in China. Been able to encourage projects in social action and evangelism. We've supported the church in Eastern Europe got behind mission in France, helped to train pastors in Africa and the United Kingdom. Over the past five years, over 600 projects have benefited from your generous giving, and we simply wanted to say thank you. Thank you. And now let me show you some of the ways in which your giving has affected the work of God across the world. Two years ago, we had a special focus in our offerings for the persecuted church. More Christians were killed for their faith in the 20th century than in all the previous centuries put together. The largest group of people being persecuted for their faith in the world today are Christians. In over 40 countries, our sisters and brothers are intimidated, harassed, tortured and even killed. The money you gave was used to petition governments and the UN, provide over 20,000 Bibles, and give practical expressions of care, helping families in Indonesia, Nigeria, Sudan, and China. You have touched the lives of countless individuals. You've also helped some of the world's poorest people. Providing things that you and I take for granted, but for two thirds of the world's population are a luxury item. Clean water, education, food, medicines. You've given to charities and projects that are doing the work on the ground where it counts most. You bought water pumps for schools in Eastern Zimbabwe, supplying water for drinking and irrigation for over 4,000 people. It's not just food and wealth that's dividing the world's rich and poor. Less than 1.5% of the world's population have access to basic IT skills and the internet. Some of the money you gave last year 
has gone to support and fund IT training in partnership with local churches. And through your giving, you are touching individuals across the world. Real people with real problems for whom you are making a real difference. And the money you have given is challenging, changing and affecting people much closer to home. Your gifts have supported a number of local and national projects based here in the UK. From smaller projects that help local communities to large social action and evangelism initiatives. One of the projects you have helped is a local church initiative which ensures that food which would have been thrown away is used to provide one hot healthy meal a day for vulnerable people. Through Festival Manchester and this summer's Soul in the City, you are helping people to reach out to those around. You're demonstrating that the church is alive, important and has a crucial role to play in shaping our nation. And this is just a tiny glimpse of the phenomenal way in which your gifts are making a difference to thousands of people. This year's theme at Spring Harvest is grace. And we're looking to God for a grace reaction that's going to impact many individuals, churches and neighbourhoods. So in Jesus' name, thank you. On behalf of those organisations and individuals that your generous gifts have gone to support. And may God bless you as you continue to share something of his grace with people that you meet. That was Ian Coffey, who's part of the Spring Harvest leadership team. Shall we pray and thank God together for what we've seen and the impact this event's made over the years? Father, we do thank you for each one of those people that we've just seen. Too many to number, even on that small selection. People we know whose lives have been changed. Hope has been given to them. Freedom has come to them. Liberation is theirs. Forgiveness is theirs. Salvation is theirs. New birth is theirs. Because of what many people over many years have given through Spring Harvest. We thank you for the work that's going on, for the resources that have been released, not just financially from Spring Harvest, but in terms of people, volunteers, people who've traveled the world to bring good news to those who have no hope. We pray simply that this year, once again, across the two Spring Harvest sites and the weeks of Spring Harvest, we'll be able to release the resources that will change lives and eventually change countries. Lord, we pray this for the glory of God, that your kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Tomorrow evening, each one of us is going to have an opportunity to give here in the Big Top or at any of the other celebrations that you go to. And there are all sorts of ways of giving. You can give by credit or debit card or IOU or pay by check or cash. And when you come along tomorrow evening, there'll be uh, some envelopes, some special envelopes prepared, which you can place your offering in. Uh, and if you're a taxpayer in the UK, you know that, and you fill that in, it's a very simple thing to do. It allows us to claim the tax back on that uh, money, which increases greatly the benefit that we're able to bring. It's an efficient and effective way of giving, as I'm uh, sure you know. So this is just to say, tomorrow evening, please come, pray about it, think about it. Perhaps you know what God's, or you will know what God's telling you to give, but come along armed with a checkbook or your credit card or whatever, or some cash in your pocket, and let's give generously and gladly to God's work together. And now, Graham. All right, let's stand together, shall we? We've put aside some time where we can just express our love for God. It's not about the songs, it's about what the songs are about. And uh, this is a time uh, to focus entirely with the help of the songs on loving and thanking God. So let's just take a moment, let's close our eyes and pray and ask God's help because he sent his Holy Spirit to help us to worship. Lord, we thank you that you are a God so worthy of our worship. We thank you that you've given us the gospel which is the core material of our worship the truth that we sing back to you. And Lord, as we sing your story, we're singing our story as well. And we thank you, Lord God, that uh, you lift us up into your future and your destiny 
into all that you are and all that you've done. We thank you for your beautiful love, your deep, deep love. Amen. learned this earlier oh the deep deep love of Jesus oh the deep deep love of Jesus lost a measure boundless free rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me underneath me all many ways in which God has been good to us. Let's express our thanks, our gratefulness as we sing, Lord, you've been good to me. Lord, you've been good to me all my life, all my life. Your loving kindness never fails. I will remember all you have done. Bring from. Your loving kindness. 
one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. That's why my eyes are on you, oh Lord. Surround me, defend me, oh how I need you. To you I lift up my soul, to you I lift up my soul. No one whose hope, no one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. That's why my eyes are on you, oh Lord. Surround me, defend me, oh how I need you. To you I lift up my soul, to you I lift up my soul.
soul up to the Lord. All up, oh, I'll open my soul. His yoke is easy. All up, His burden is light. You will find rest. You'll find rest for your soul. You'll find rest for your soul. Lift up your soul. Lift up your pain. Lift up your longing. Lift up your disappointments. Lift up your dreams. Lift up your hopes. Lift up your fears. Isaiah 11, the spirit of counsel and power, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord, yes, he will delight in the fear of the Lord, that's our Jesus. He will delight the fear of the Lord. That's our Jesus. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. And he won't decide by what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge. And with justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. Yes, with righteousness, he will judge the needy. And with justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. That's our Jesus. Sing that together, that's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. Everybody sing, that's our Jesus. Come on, lift your voice. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on Him. That's our Jesus. The Spirit of wisdom and of understanding. That's our Jesus, the spirit of counsel and of power. That's our Jesus, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. That's our Jesus. One more time. That's our Jesus. out those words. I love you, Jesus. Just in your own time. Just, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Come on. I love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen.
Amen. That's our Jesus. Do be seated. And taking us further on, our good friends Rob Lacey and uh, Bill and Rachel work with him over to you guys. You know, even the most, even the most familiar songs can become too familiar. They're beautiful songs. We sing them too much. Maybe they become over familiar. Dare I say it? Amazing Grace could be one of those songs, but simply by putting a different tune. To much loved words, the whole thing can be transformed. Well, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Beautiful words. Recognize the tune. There is a house in New Orleans They call the rising sun And it's been the run of many poor boy Lord, I know I'm one Meanwhile, we're in here singing our beautiful songs through many through dangers toils and snares we so have already come Jean. tell me about it he says father was a gambling man down in new orleans what's this guy's story what's he been through While well, we're in here, he's out there busking, and we're singing about heaven. When we've been there Maybe ten thousand years, right do what I have done. We've known the days to sing God's praise. They call it the rising sun. How desperate is he? How hungry is he? How thirsty is he? And what are we going to do about it? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Carry on singing our songs. It's been the rain of me. How does he get to hear? And learn new lyrics. I, see. I was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. Now I was blind, but now I see. Now I was blind, but now I see. In grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Don't you just love a happy ending? Shame. Because it isn't always so. house in New Orleans they call the rising sun and it's been the ruin 
of many poor boys. Of many a poor girl. And Lord, I know, I know I'm one. There, but for the grace of God, go I. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. <clears throat> but as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. <clears throat> at this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is this not Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling amongst yourselves, Jesus said. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who li listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you can eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread 
that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. Lord, may I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I've got a, a solution to Steve Chalk's problem, actually, um, because those of you who know your Greek mythology uh, will know there was a guy called Procrustes, and Procrustes had the solution to all bed problems. Uh, he was one of the guys that uh, Hercules met during his 12 labours, uh, and uh, Procrustes came along and he said, everybody who comes along fits my bed. And it was true, because Procrustes would deal with them. Uh, either if they were too short, he would take his club to them and beat them very, very hard until they stretched out and they fitted his bed exactly. Or if they stuck out over the end of the bed, like Steve Chalk, they would chop the legs off so they fitted exactly. So Steve... Think Greek mythology and you'll be all right. And there is a danger, isn't there, for preachers that uh, they try and do that with texts from Scripture. Uh, that's why we pray before the beginning, isn't it? That we will speak the words of God from Scripture and not try and make what we want to say fit the text. So you must test me against that and say, has he actually spoken from Scripture or not? In the evenings, we're journeying through John's Gospel to see the grace of God uh, in Jesus Christ. On night one, uh, we looked at the call of the disciples from John chapter one. Uh, last night, we looked at the Samaritan woman at the well. And tonight, uh, as Rob was helping us see, uh, Jesus in dialogue uh, with the Jewish leaders in John chapter six. You'll probably recall the story, it's quite a long chunk of John's Gospel, uh, but the context is this. Jesus feeds 5,000 people uh, and then disappears and he crosses the lake, uh, walking on water, and gets into controversy. The people want to know where he gets the power to do this feeding 5,000 people. They are fascinated uh, by this miracle worker. They want to know more. They're even more fascinated when he turns up at the other side of the lake and there is no boat. But they also want to argue with him about what it is that he's actually saying and doing. They are concerned to find out what he's teaching, what he's saying, uh, what he's symbolizing uh, by the action of feeding 5,000 people. Uh, and this whole controversy is commentary on, reflection on uh, that five, feeding of the 5,000. And what I think it does is it helps us with getting into this whole thing about rhythms of grace in our lives. Today, uh, we've been thinking together about how we can have the rhythm and pace of God in our lives, uh, how it is that God breaks into our lives. Uh, and what Jesus had to say to us here helps us, it seems to me, in getting close uh, to some of the mysteries that are involved in how God breaks in. Uh, you probably heard the story about the atheist who went fishing on Loch Ness. Uh, and uh, it was a fine day. He stuck his rod out over the boat in the middle of, the, of Loch Ness, uh, very, very happily fishing away. Unfortunately, the Loch Ness monster appears. Uh, and the atheist is fishing away, uh, not realizing the Loch Ness monster's around. And as he fishes, the monster comes up under the boat and tosses him in the air. Fishing line atheist, boat. They're all flying up into the air. And as he flies up into the air, the atheist cries out, God help me! 
freeze frame. Atheist suspended in midair, boat suspended in midair, fishing line suspended in midair, Loch Ness monster with jaws open, suspended halfway out of the lock. And God says to the atheist, I thought you didn't believe in me. And the atheist says, give us a break, Lord. Two minutes ago, I didn't believe the Loch Ness Monster either. <laughs> and that, it seems to me, is too often how we think about grace erupting into our lives. We're looking for those miraculous moments. We have this thought that grace only happens when it's something spectacular like that. You know, if God could freeze frame for me, I'd be convinced about him. I know there are times when it has been truly miraculous how God's worked in my life, in your life. Uh, and no one's gainsaying that. But if we're not careful, what we do is we make the grace of God something that only erupts in those very special situations. If you're asked to speak about your experience of God, quite often people will give their testimony. And it's marvellous, isn't it? You can talk about how God saved you. Uh, but it might be 10, 20, 30 years ago. And we sometimes forget that God breaks through in all sorts of ways in our experience. And I want us to reflect tonight on how it is that God breaks into grace encounters into our lives. Let's start then with verse 41 of the passage. The Jews began to complain about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying... Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I've come down from heaven? And my first question to you is, can we cope with God in the ordinary? Can we cope with God in the ordinary? You see, people didn't like the idea that Jesus might have been something more than a carpenter's son from Nazareth. They knew him. He was familiar. Uh, they didn't like the idea that what he was doing was something special uh, and that he was claiming things supernatural about himself. And yet, at one level, that's precisely what he was. We know he was more than that. He was declared to be more than that. But what they saw was the ordinary carpenter's son. And they didn't want to realize that God could break through in an ordinary carpenter's son. It wasn't within their time scale, their framework, or anything else. That wasn't how the Messiah was to appear. And I think that sometimes our problem with encounters of grace is that we want only the spectacular, only the gift wrapped, only the things with fanfares and trumpets. Uh, and we're a bit disappointed with God if actually what happens is he's there in the ordinary. And yet... He is there in the ordinary, and it would help us immensely if we made room for the fact that he's there in the ordinary, that God can speak through people we aren't expecting him to, through encounters uh, that seem to be perfectly normal and, and uh, mundane. Over there, you've got a picture on, on the, on the uh, painting board uh, of a cafe encounter, and behind that, uh, some kind of sense that something else is going on uh, behind the encounter, which takes you into the depths of the picture. Is God there in the encounters of the ordinary? You see, we are looking always for something big and dramatic. Uh, do you remember C.S. Lewis's story, The Last Battle, uh, which is the story of the ending of Narnia? Uh, and uh, they're waiting throughout that story for Aslan the lion, who's the picture of Jesus, the, uh, the one who represents Jesus, to turn up. Uh, and those who are living in Narnia at the time are very sceptical. And they're saying, come on, where's Aslan? Where's Aslan? He's not around. Uh, and the only response that comes through from people, well, he's not a tame lion. He doesn't turn up to order. And that becomes a kind of shout of derision. He's not a tame lion. He's not a tame lion. You won't see him around. And we somehow have got ourselves in the situation where we believe the lies the world has told us. That God is not around in his world. That he's not a tame lion. In fact, he's not, not around at all. He's kind of absent. He only makes spectacular appearances. And I want us as Christians to recapture the fact that God is there in the cafe encounter. 
God is there in this carpenter, this seeming nobody. Of course, he wasn't nobody, but that's what they thought. This reality that God can speak through all kinds of people. Have a think in your own life. Where are the moments of grace that have taken place where perhaps, if you're not careful, you might have missed them? Uh, because God was speaking to you through a person you weren't looking to, the person that you actually looked down on in church, uh, the person at work who's that slightly crumbly Christian uh, who uh, is a bit embarrassing to you. And yet sometimes it's them that God uses, the ordinary encounters, the ordinary places, or again, at places Sometimes we think that only in church or on mountaintops is where God appears, but he's there in the ordinary as well. Uh, he's a God who wants to make himself manifest and apparent. He's a God of revelation. That's what God does. We have a God who wants to show himself to us, to reveal himself to us. He is a communicating God. Uh, and therefore, we should expect that our world should be shot through with rumours of the God who exists. Uh, and yet we have believed the lie that's been told us by our secular society uh, that God isn't really around. And it's very easy, you know, if you're not careful, to live in a kind of plausibility structure of an absent God. Yes, he turns up at spring harvest or in very good church services, but in our daily working lives, well, is he around? Isn't he? Whose rules do I live by? We need to live, brothers and sisters, by the rules that say that at any time, in any place, anywhere, our God is present. He's around. He's there in the ordinary. And we can't dictate to God where he'll turn up. He isn't a tame lion. He'll appear in all kinds of places. We need to recapture that sense that this is not a closed universe, but that God is ever present. The transcendent God has become imminent in our universe for us. It's not true that uh, that's the experience of all Christians. Our African brothers and sisters are very conscious of the reality of God in everyday life. But somehow for us Westerners, uh, we're very bad at making room for him. Can we cope uh, with God in the ordinary? Because the world is shot through with grace. And then secondly, not only is it that uh, Jesus the carpenter, this ordinary person as they thought he was, is the revealer of God in this situation, but he also tells that all grace is entirely God's grace. Verse 44, uh, don't complain among yourselves, Jesus says, no one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I'll raise that person up on the last day. There is no other source of grace. We've said grace is not a commodity. We've been teaching about grace already this week and trying to get ourselves to see that it's not something we hold in our hands. It's God in his personhood, God in his personality, God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit who breaks into our lives and it's his grace and his presence that makes grace possible in our daily encounters. There is no other source of grace. And what we know about our relationship with God when we first found him was that we didn't know quite often we were looking for him, did we? Think back to your own experience of becoming a Christian, whether it was a, a long, slow journey or an instantaneous experience. I guess many of us would say, yes, I was looking, but I didn't realise that God was looking for me. I wasn't sure... I suddenly found that God was on the lookout and he came and found me. There's a very famous poem written by a Christian author called The Hound of Heaven, uh, which was very popular uh, early, this, early last century. And the Hound of Heaven talked about a God who pursues us, uh, even though we don't know he's looking for us. I fled him all the way, the poem said, uh, but the Hound of Heaven came and found me. And that's grace. That's grace. That's the God who comes and seeks us. And it's all his grace. C.S. Lewis, in his reflections on becoming a Christian, would say he had a huge consciousness of this God uh, who was around. He made uh, connections between God and the mythological stories that he read and enjoyed and loved. Uh, he would say that he became a theist. He believed in the existence of God. 
Uh, but he says that only when he actually discovered that Jesus Christ was God on a bus going up Headington Hill in Oxford uh, did he begin to realise that God had been pursuing him all the time. Uh, and that was the grace encounter. Think back to your own experiences of God. You thought that you were looking for him, uh, but you found he was looking for you. All grace is God's grace. Now, I don't want you to miss out if you're here this week and you're not yet in the Christian bit. Uh, some of you have been brought here by uh, your husband or wife or you've tagged along for the journey uh, or you've come to drive the car uh, or you've been saying, oh, well, I'll come along and find out this spring harvest stuff. Uh, and the Christian thing isn't yet yours. And I want to say to you, don't miss out on the grace of God, which might well just be nudging and pursuing you. I preach a lot of confirmation services. They're great joys, confirmation services, because these days, uh, most people who get confirmed are dead serious about it. Uh, it's not an easy option. About half the people I confirm are adults. Uh, they've come to faith through Alpha or Emmaus or something similar. They give testimony. Do make room for testimony in your churches, by the way. Tell your story to each other. Stand up and talk about it. Don't be flipping Anglican, you know, don't just sort of keep it quiet. Speak about your faith to others and do it in church too. But I preach in confirmation services uh, and I find that time and time again, I'm speaking to the heathen relatives. The person getting confirmed is really up for this but they brought all kinds of people from their family uh, for the bean feast afterwards, for the booze up, uh, and they're sitting in church, and they're a bit fidgety, they're not quite sure, and then blow me, this bishop comes along, and he starts having a go at them. You know, I actually, I, I don't tend to stand still when I preach, I tend to walk down the aisle uh, to the people at the back and start talking to them. Because I'm meant to be, I'll start talking to you if you're not careful. Because <laughs> my job, I am paid by the Church of England, to be a God-botherer. That's what my job is. Uh, and therefore, to go and say to people, okay, these people are being confirmed in the Christian faith. These are the things that we are saying about them. We pray over them, that wonderful prayer that uh, Graham was singing earlier from Isaiah chapter 11. We are saying all kinds of things about them. But what about you guys? What about you folk who are watching? The Supporters Club, I say to them. What about the supporters club? Do you want to come and join in? I want to come back in a year and confirm you lot too, I say to them. Some of them do too. Now, this is not a confirmation sermon, but it's much the same thing. I'm talking about the grace of God. The grace of God pursues people to make them Christians. Uh, God is like that. He loves you to pieces and he wants you to find God in Jesus Christ. Uh, and I want to say to you, if you're here uh, and you're not yet part of the club, uh, it's a club worth joining because it's actually not a club, it's a kingdom. Uh, and you will be a part of an institution which is not an institution, but something much more radical than that. Uh, and it's called the people of God, the body of Christ, uh, the people of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. So I want to provoke you. If you're here at Spring Harvest this week uh, and you are not yet a Christian, the grace of God may well be pursuing you. Watch out. He's like that. And he won't let you go, you know. He'll keep on bothering you. Uh, until you can respond to him. Don't know where, don't know when, don't know how, uh, but just keep listening, uh, because that God, who is the God of grace, because all grace is entirely God's grace, uh, may well pursue you. This verse will come true for you. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I'll raise them up on the last day. If God's drawing you, don't ignore him. And then thirdly, it's... Grace that is common grace. We had this in the, in the teaching guide this morning. It's common grace for all are taught by God. Verse 45. It's written in the prophets, they should all be taught by God. Everyone who's heard and learned from the Father comes to me. God has not left himself without witnesses in the world. His grace is common to all humanity. Uh, and we need, to, as Christians, to be able to say that in each person we know and see, we can see the grace of God in some way. If people are made in God's image, they reflect the grace of God in that common grace way. That's the Reformers' description. Uh, common grace means that each of us in common receives something of the grace of God in our lives, whoever we are. My Hindu neighbour, my Muslim neighbour, my Sikh neighbour, my atheist neighbour. All of them have the spark of God. They need to find Jesus Christ. That's clear. 
They can't come to God except through Jesus. That's clear. But let me not denigrate what they might know about God. Let me draw them on and let me say to them, Jesus Christ fulfills and completes and transforms any experience of God that you have beforehand. Because we believe in that common grace of God. And you see, we need to be able to see God in the person whose personality is most marred and deformed. I love The Lord of the Rings. I think it's fantastic in terms of how it's portrayed, Tolkien's book. And perhaps the best characterization of all of them is Gollum, Schmeagol. Yeah? Isn't it amazing? He's got him right. My precious. Do you think he's Welsh? But of course, the thing about Smeagol, Gollum, is that there are those moments when you can see the spark of what he once was. The humanity was there. He's he's completely in his personality corrupted by his love for the ring. All he wants is to get his hands on that ring. That lust for power has so distorted him that he's become a creature of abhorrence. And yet, there are glimpses in the film and in the book too where the real Smeagol comes through, where you see the spark of humanity. That's common grace. That's what we need to ask God to help us see in our neighbour. The person you find it hardest to get on with, the person you despise, the person you say to yourself, God could never make them a Christian. And yet we know that the common grace of God is in them and that spark of God's life will be there and it's for us to seek it out and find out what God wants to say through them. All are taught by God. Uh, And Smeagol, Gollum, can be renewed and changed. Your friend, your neighbour, can be renewed and changed because the grace of God has not departed from them. God calls them. God calls everybody. Uh, And we need to ask God to give us that love for our fellow human beings that says everybody is loved by God because God speaks to all. Uh, God needs to teach us to see people's infinite worth and common grace. And then next, in this dialogue that Jesus has, we discover uh, that the key to the sacramental life that we've been talking about lies in the incarnation. Uh, Jesus goes on to say, he says, not that anyone's seen the Father except the one who's from the Father. He has seen the Father. If we believe that God speaks to us through sacraments, through signs of his life in the world, through outward signs of his grace, how does that work? It works because in Christianity, God became a human being. And in becoming a human being, he made the whole universe sanctified in a a mysterious way. It's still a flawed universe, It's still a fallen universe. But the incarnation means that human beings, the creation, the world of nature, can never be the same again. We believe as Christians uh, that Jesus came into the world uh, and that in doing so, he took humanity back into the Godhead. When he lived and died and rose again, he didn't just say, okay, I've done with my human body, that's it, chuck it away. He took humanity back into the Godhead. There is now a human being in heaven, in Jesus. That's what the Bible teaches us. Uh, And that therefore, the key to our sacramental understanding is the incarnation. It says, in God, in Jesus Christ, our world is shot through with rumours of who God is. And it's because of Jesus that, that that's possible. No one's seen the Father except the one who's from from God. He's seen the Father. And because of that, we too can see the Father. You don't know what God looks like. I don't know what God looks like. But I do know that I see God in Jesus Christ. And that's enough for us. It's more than enough. It makes the whole universe different. And that subversive kingdom of God is now established among us. And the world can never be the same again. 
Uh, that means that if we believe that there is a sacramental life to things, there are places where God breaks through, it's because Jesus made it possible. We can touch the infinite. We can touch the mystery of God because Jesus has been here and made this world a place where grace encounters can take place. And therefore, next, we live in a world of thin places. Thin places, verse 47 onwards. Uh, Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. You see, what God has done in Jesus is he's touched matter, he's touched the earth, he's touched humanity, he's touched the places Jesus walked, he's touched the whole universe, and he's said, I am now among you in all sorts of ways, in all sorts of places. The key to understanding how it is uh, that God can be there in the ordinary, as we spoke about earlier, is that we look out for the thin places. Here's a phrase that comes from Celtic theology originally, but I find it fascinating. That sense that within a very short time scale or in a very imminent place, God is there and you've sensed it. You might be at prayer uh, and suddenly you felt, yeah, God's here, God's present with me. Uh, You might be in one of those conversations that people sometimes have uh, with a friend or a neighbour and you thought, hey, this is weird, God's present. Look out for those thin places. Often they're places hallowed by prayer. That's why uh, retreat houses, uh, mountain tops, and other places are so amazing because they are places where uh, God has broken through in times gone past. I've got a thick nose as well as a thin place. We need to say to God, Show me those thin places. Our sense of mystery, our sense of awe, our sense of the presence and closeness of God can be cultivated as we seek out places of encounter, places where God becomes real. See, what happened uh, in the wilderness was they had the manna which fed them. uh, And the manna was something which they ate, but which did not in the end bring them to God's presence because they died, because they were faithless. But the manna was a place where God broke through. And Jesus says, well, my presence with you as the bread of life, my hallowing of the whole of creation by my incarnation, means that I can break through and those thin places can be real and therefore I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Of course, they were were mystified, they were puzzled. They couldn't see what he was getting at. But we know that by his spirit, Jesus still makes himself present in the thin places. And therefore, look out for those places of encounter. Uh, People, special places, chance encounters, objects. Uh, I find that when I'm praying, uh, sometimes objects like icons and crosses can be useful. Candles can be useful. Uh, to bring me into God's presence. And there's a sense that as you cultivate your consciousness that God's with you as you pray, uh, then the place you pray becomes a thin place. If those things don't work for you, fair enough. But find your own place of being where God can be more and more real to you. Cultivate the thin places. Help God inhabit your universe. And as he does, he'll break through in his sacramental life. We live in a world of thin places. And then next, how do we know this works? How can I tell that I'm not making all this up? How can I tell that I'm not kidding myself? Uh, Again, you might remember from one of uh, the stories of C.S. Lewis, uh, where Puddle Glum uh, is around. I forget what the story was. Was it Silver Chair, wasn't it? Silver Chair. Uh, Where the white witch is trying to convince the children and Puddle Glum, the uh, that there is no such thing as uh, Aslan, there is no such thing as a beyond realm. Uh, and the children and Puddle Glum say, well, we're pretty convinced that even in a universe where we can't see very much, uh, that there is still a God. We'll put our trust in Aslan even if we can't see him. Uh, we all have periods of doubt. 
We all have times when we're not sure that God is actually real. Even uh, those of us who are ordained, those of us who are meant to be leaders of the church, will sometimes say, am I kidding myself? How do we know? Well, here's the truth. Verse 51, Jesus is the guarantee that there is reality in the unseen world. Jesus is the guarantee that there is reality. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus ties in the fact that it's in his life and death and resurrection that we know the reality of this unseen world. How can we know that God is real? It's Jesus. What am I forced back to? Whenever I doubt my faith, whenever I'm not sure whether it's all real at all, I go back to the person of Jesus. And I can make no sense of the universe or of Jesus unless I know that he is who he claimed to be, unless I know that he is God. He is the person who centers my faith. He is the person who says to me, look, come on, what did you believe in? You didn't kid yourself about what you believe about me. I am real. I did live. I did die. I did rise again. I am the revelation of God. You probably heard the story about the priest who liked uh, playing golf. Uh, and he was a great golfing fan. It wasn't Ian Coffey, though. Ian Coffey was, uh, was always uh, very fond of golf stories. Uh, but this priest was so fond of playing golf, he would take every opportunity uh, to go off and play golf. And uh, one morning, it was a Sunday, and he woke up, and it was brilliant sunshine, very little wind, and he thought, of course, Sunday. But wouldn't I like to be out on the golf course? And he looked out, and he thought, oh, yeah, come on. So he phones up, phones his curate, and says, uh, sorry, I'm very ill today. He pulls a sickie. Uh, and uh, he says, I can't do the service, uh, can you do it for me? Uh, and uh, then he gets in his car, drives about two hours to make sure he's well out of place where he'd be known or seen, uh, and gets on the golf course. Uh, and he's on the first tee, it's a beautiful day still, sun is shining, and he's about to tee off on the first tee. And an angel looks down and sees him and says to God, Oi, God, this is a bit rich, isn't it? This bloke's taking the mickey. Aren't you going to punish him for what he's doing? And God says, well, I suppose I ought to, really. So the priest tees off on the first tee, hits a beautiful shot right down the fairway, goes about 250 yards, so it's not a very long hole, but it just bounces beautifully onto the green, bounces straight down the hole, hole in one. And the angel says to God, I thought you were going to punish him. And God says, yeah, well, think about it. Who can he tell? <laughs> and sometimes our view of God is like that, that we think God's out to get us, uh, that God is a vindictive God. But actually, what this picture of who Jesus is, this amazing assurance of who Jesus is in verse 51 is about is saying to us God is not like that he's the one who sacrificed himself for us I'm the living bread that came down from heaven whoever eats this bread will live forever the bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh the God who proves himself to us in Jesus is not a vindictive God he's the God who gives us the reality of his astounding amazing love for us poured out on the cross that's the God we believe in, not the one who's out to punish us. And I want to try and help people see uh, that there are many people who are out there looking for a God who's like that. Uh, we find in London that there are still people searching for faith. It's a very secular city, a very pluralist city, but there are still people all see seeking out uh, God and trying to find him. Uh, we get people walking into our churches one of our churches has its website up on the outside and folk will find the website uh, and come along and find services. They walk in off the street, which is really weird for London. And they say, hello, I, I found you on the, on the internet uh, and we've come, I've come to find out about God. Uh, and they're running alpha courses with loads of people who've come in uh, completely out of uh, the blue uh, who have discovered that there is a church here that wants to tell them about God uh, and it's this Jesus who's revealed himself. Plenty of people out there looking uh, for that guarantee of Jesus who is the one who reveals uh, the unseen realm. 
and plenty of people looking for an unseen realm, which Jesus is the one who reveals to them. And then the last thing I want to say is the rest of the passage, which is uh, about Jesus feeding us uh, with the living bread. It's verses 52 to 59, that feeding on Jesus in communion is the thinnest place there is. We've talked today uh, throughout our teaching about sacramental life, about God breaking through. But God has given us two great sacraments, uh, baptism and holy communion. And they are the places that he said he will meet us specially. They're the ones he's ordained whereby we really get into thin place relationship with God and Jesus Christ. Some of you might find uh, using John 6 to talk about communion difficult uh, because some people believe that John 6 is not about communion. <laughs> Very thick. Don't go there. comes with being on butlins for, for two weeks, you get this kind of fug building up in your throat. Never mind. John chapter 6 is a place which seems to me supremely to be about encounter with Jesus in communion. And I think for this reason I want to say that I think it is something that, that speaks about communion. John does not give us the Last Supper in his Gospel. John's Gospel is all about how Jesus reveals himself, but what Jesus does at the Last Supper uh, in John is he washes the disciples' feet. He doesn't give us uh, communion. Uh, the other Gospels give us communion. And that's because John focuses his teaching on communion here in John chapter 6. That's my belief. Uh, you can pay your money and take your choice about the interpretation, but bear with me if you don't like this interpretation, because I think it begins to help us see. Uh, the Jews disputed among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said, truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I'll raise them up on the last day. My flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. We're going to share communion in a few minutes. And what Jesus is saying there, it seems to me, is nothing magical about bread and wine. It's nothing sacrificial about bread and wine in the sense that uh, some have taught it in church but it is about the fact that when we come to receive bread and wine uh, when we eat and drink we are truly receiving something of the life of Jesus Christ in us it is a thin place where he has said he will meet with us and he does he breaks through uh, and he gives us his strength and his life it's not automatic you have to be receiving him by faith. You have to be open to him. Uh, you have to be saying, Jesus, come and feed me. But as you open yourself to him, so your faith meets his grace which came before. And in a special way, he gives you himself. And you feed and are strengthened by him. Now, I think that's a fantastic thing. That's a really impressive, amazing way that God said to us, look, in the, the very ordinary bits of eating and drinking, the things you have to do to stay alive as a human being, I've given you a sign. And that sign is not just a sign that's uh, about something that happened long ago. Each time you do it, you will be renewed. You'll be fed. You'll be nourished. Your faith will be increased. You'll be strengthened. You'll be sent out for service. You'll sacrifice yourself for me uh, as I give myself to you, Jesus says. We meet him by faith, verse 54. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. He feeds us and strengthens us, verse 55. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life. Uh, he sustains us, verse 60, 56. Those who eat my flesh and blood abide in me, and I abide in them. Uh, and he prepares us and takes us forward for eternal life, verse 57. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever he eats me will live because of me. It's strong language. We find it difficult because of all the controversy that the church has had over the years about our understanding of communion and the fact we still differ about it. But take at face value that Jesus meets us in this special way and he strengthens us and feeds us. And so the story of tonight, the story we're needing to take away and reflect upon is this. 
are we ready to have our faith and our experience of Jesus stretched? Are you ready to renew your commitment to him? Will you seek him in thin places in your daily life? Not just here in the big top at Spring Harvest where it's easy uh, to meet him, uh, but in the hard places of work, of home, of the school gate. Will you look out for God in the everyday and enable yourself to be open to the possibility that he'll break through to you? Will you in your life of Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, be saying to him, Lord, meet me. Meet me in those thin places. Make yourself real to me. Fill me up with an experience of the eternal. Break apart that curtain uh, so that I can see the mystery of your life in my life in the everyday. Feed me and nourish me on my pilgrimage as I walk towards heaven. Are you ready to encounter God in the thin places? Amen.